I turned over a bright metal shell that rippled when She I... says human longing for mystery leads to a commonality of belief in immortality. Dad's late or I'm early. Either way, I have time to scout the pens. Can't Redemption and claustrophobia, what artists understand. Not valuing the... I feel very much as if I'm a native to this place. I was born and reared in Kansas and went to first Arizona and then to California to go to school, high school, um, then undergraduate school, returned to Arizona for, for graduate school. And then my husband and I came back to the Midwest when um, he was appointed to a position at the University of Nebraska. And and I came along, and this was in 1969, and we've lived here ever since. Well, for me, Cather was one of the wonderful discoveries of, of moving to Nebraska. I'd never heard of her before we moved here in 1969, and wondered who this Willa Cather was that people were talking about. At that time, American literature really wasn't included so centrally in in graduate programs, in, even in undergraduate programs, and women writers were very much mar marginalized. And so coming here and, and reading, uh, my first Cather novel was A Lost Lady, and it was, just hit me like an, a, a ton of bricks, you know, or as Emily Dickinson says, the top of your head blows off when you know it's something good. And, and that's the way I felt, and I, at the time, was completing a PhD on a completing a dissertation on Lawrence Stern, the 18th century novelist, and I, what happened was that interest in Cather moved to the center of my life, and Stern seemed more and more marginalized, so it was a, for me it was a very happy time in many ways of discovering Cather for myself. I've been teaching at the, at the University of Nebraska since 1971, first in emergency appointments, and then at the uh, at Lincoln, and then in a, on a tenure line, at the University of Nebraska at Omaha for six years, and then I returned to Lincoln and taught here for oh goodness, it's been 15 years in Cather studies, uh, an appointment that Bernice Sloat, the pioneer Cather critic, really was responsible for because it was her her work on Cather that created the the um, interest in and realization of the importance of Cather. When one says, is she really that good? I, I think of several responses, and one is that I hear the responses of students, and they'll say that they had to read her in high school sometimes. Sometimes they haven't encountered her at all, and they'll come in after reading My Antonia, for example, and they'll say, she is good. And I've had students who talk about reading Cather and then deciding they want to um, read her with someone. And oh, students who tell of, of reading her with their mothers or grandmothers or other family members. And another response is, is my own experience. I've been working on Cather for a long time now. It's been, um, I guess, 20 years. And many writers would wear thin. And with Cather, the more one works with her, my, the, the experience I've had anyway and other people working on the scholarly edition or, or other projects have found is that the more you work on her the, the greater the richness you discover and she's really that good she's even better than that it's not by chance that she is one of the the only that we only have four women listed in the Encyclopedia Britannica's great books of the Western world only one American woman and Willa Cather is that woman, and A Lost Lady is the book that was chosen, the title that was chosen. The title of the book is Birthing a Nation, Gender, Creativity, and the West in American Literature, and this was a uh, project I started, it must be 12 years ago, long time ago now, and I, as so many things, if we knew what we were getting into, we probably never would have, have jumped in, but I thought this might be two, three years, and it turned out to be a much longer um, engagement than I had expected, and one of the reasons was that other things kept 
kept this was my personal priority but it wasn't the priority of commitments I'd made in other projects and so it would get pushed aside but it also I would start on um, I'd start reading background on Marilyn Robinson or, or Jean Stafford thinking that scheduling for myself oh a month maybe and I'd, I'd be ready to write a chapter and of course you know life never turns out that way and so I'd spend three years on Stafford instead of instead of the month I had planned so um, the pleasure of it is that you really do get hooked um, the downside of that is that the schedules you set for yourself are I guess illusions that we hold on to to think that we've got some sense of what we're what we're up to so it took a long a lot longer than I had expected I had a uh, I had a wonderful time doing it. I really enjoyed the um, the time thinking about things that came up with this project. If we're looking at at um, the younger scholars who are asking what kind of a project that put themselves to thinking of themselves as critics and scholars, I think to trust their own their own instinct to ask themselves what are the the questions that that excite them or that engage them and to put aside the, the question, what should I be doing, and ask what is it I'd really like to do, and, and the project will be there, you know. It's so, that's what I would think is to, you wanna be, you, it's like with any relationship, you want to enjoy the subject, you're, the, the subject that you're working with, and so um, it may be it may be a question that, or maybe a writer who just makes you so angry you can't even stand it. Okay, trust that something's there. Or that a writer that you, you've loved since you were young and is not receiving attention at all. Well, give some attention, you know, ask why is it that, why do I keep going back to that writer? What is it that deserves, what, what hooks me? Good evening. Uh, my name is Christine Pappas, and I'd like to welcome you to the 124th of the series, the John H. Ames Reading Series here at the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room of Nebraska Authors. The Geske Heritage Room is a special collection dedicated to preserving and promoting works by and about Nebraska authors. We currently maintain a collection of over 11,000 volumes written by more than 4,000 Nebraska authors. In an effort to promote the literatures of Nebraska, the Geske Heritage Room, along with the literary Heritage Association sponsors the John H. Ames Reading Series. Special thanks go to the members of NLHA who's, through whose efforts make this reading possible. Um, this evening we're going to hear a reading from um, Susan Rozowski and I'd like to start by saying that Willa Cather sits at the center of Nebraska letters and a, a scholar of Willa Cather once described her as a Mount Rushmore in the way that she looms above the Nebraskan and the American literary scene. Professor Rosaski sits at the center of the Cather criticism. <laughs> in her book, Birthing a Nation, Gender Creativity, and the West in American Literature, published in 1999 by the University of Nebraska Press, Sue argues for a reconceptualization of our mythology of the West. She urges that we accept the metaphor of birthing and creation rather than the metaphor of the conquering the unknown. Birthing and creation is also an apt metaphor for the scholarly career that Sue has enjoyed. She has helped create and nurture a generation of Cather scholars. And every one of Sue's students and colleagues with whom I've spoken um, hold her in the highest esteem. Sue received her BA from Whittier College and her MA and PhD from the University of Arizona. She has taught at UNL since 1976, becoming the Adele Hall Distinguished Professor in 1991, and she has received the highest honors possible from the university for her teaching. In 1986, her book, The Voyage Perilous, um, well, it is a leading Cather text, and it was published in 1986, and Sue has served as an editor on the Catherly Scholarly Editions Project. Um, in 1999, Sue published Birthing a Nation, a book which flowed from her interests, and a book that would win the Western Literature Association's prestigious Thomas J. Lyon Book Award for the best book-length study on the literature and the culture of the American West in 1999. Uh, Susan Rosowski is a special friend to the Geske Heritage Room, and she once said, to browse in the Heritage Room is to explore Nebraska, and it is with great pleasure that I, and friendship that I welcome her to speak to us this evening. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Chris. Um, what I thought I might do is to talk a little, a little bit about, um, to provide an overview of the argument of birthing a nation, to give a little bit of the background of it, to um, provide an overview of the argument itself. Willa Cather is a familiar uh, figure in, in the, um, among the four writers that I focus on, but the other three may not be quite so familiar. And so to describe what, what is happening with each of them as I see it, and then to read from the afterward. Uh, in, um, in starting the research that led to birthing a nation, I was seeking alternatives to the political discourse of confrontation and the fragmentation of post-structuralism. I was asking how literature might bring us together, in other words. I was looking, to be frank, for an epic idea that might offer a principle of inclusion as an alternative to the much maligned master plot so closely identified with Frederick Jackson Turner and the popular Western in literature and in film. I'm very much aware, I might add, that words such as epic tradition and national identity are flashpoints in today's lexicon, harbingers of hegemonic oppression. But exploring oppositions has become facile. The far more interesting challenge, and the profoundly important one, is to ask how, how we might come together. I ended up focusing upon four writers, Margaret Fuller, Willa Cather, Jean Stafford, and Marilyn Robinson. And while I set out hoping to find an alternative a cult to a cultural myth, that is, the, an alternative cultural myth, an American Eve perhaps as an alternative to Lewis's American Adam, what I found was neither a figure, figure nor a creed, but instead a state or habit of mind. My talk, in, in one sense, concerns belief. And here I'm quoting from the dictionary, belief in the sense of a state or habit of mind in which trust, confidence, or reliance is placed in some person or thing. That is, trust, confidence, and faith. The trust, confidence, and reliance that my four writers shared was in language. The capacity of language to sustain a deep and ongoing reflection upon and engagement with the ideas and values that inform our lives. Fuller, Cather, Stafford, and Robinson respond, each in her own time, to cultural myth of the, of the conventional Western, the popular, popular Western, that is. I divided my comments into four parts, four stages of this multi-generational response. The Prelude. In 1843, the Bostonian Margaret Fuller traveled west to Niagara Falls, to Buffalo, by steamboat to Chicago, through northern Illinois, and on to Milwaukee and Wisconsin Territory, then returned to Chicago and home to Massachusetts. Keeping a journal to record her thoughts, she headed west in search of the muse, or as she wrote, quote, by reverent faith to woo the mighty meaning of the scene, perhaps to foresee the law by which a new order, a new poetry, is to be evoked from this chaos. She sought, in other words, to forge a new American identity. The journal that she published in 1843 with the title Summer on the Lakes records her failure to do so. For lacking the language to translate her experiences, Margaret Fuller remained an outsider. After hearing an amusing account of a farmer's adventures among the Indians, for example, Fuller demurred, quote, but I want talent to write it down, and I've not heard the slang of these people intimately enough. Another quote, there were many sportsmen stories told too, but I do not retain any of these well enough to write them down. The word pleasant recurs through the final scenes of summer, a diminutive and ironic reminder that Fuller's experiences of the West did not result in the ecstatic loss of self that she had anticipated. Quote, how pleasant it was to sit down and hear rough men Tell, tell pieces out of their own common lives. Summer builds to Fuller's acknowledgement that the West is forever closed to her. Quote, I shall not enter into that truly wild and free region, shall not have the canoe voyage, whose daily adventure with the camping out at night beneath the stars would have given an interlude of such value to my existence. I shall not see the pictured rocks. It did not depend upon me. It never has, whether th such things be done or not. 
My friends, may they see and do and be more, especially those who have before them a greater number of birthdays and a more healthy and unfettered existence. Part two, the creation. As if responding to Fuller's plea, Willa Cather was born in exactly the right circumstances to take up the, ch the challenge of giving birth to a nation. In 1873, just 11 years after the Homestead Act, the Cather family began emigrating from Virginia to Nebraska. Willa was born in Virginia that same year, and her earliest memories included hearing stories about and letters from her Nebraska relatives who were settling in and on the western frontier. Ten years later, Charles and Virginia Cather with their children joined other family members in Nebraska, where they lived briefly on a ranch in Webster County, then moved into the town of Red Cloud. Their oldest daughter, Willa, moved with them, of course, first to the ranch, then to Red Cloud, where she remained until she went to the University of Nebraska here in Lincoln, a little over 100 miles east. While Cather's idea of the West was grounded in her family's and her own experience, it was sharpened in counterpoint to the imaginative West being forged in the popular imagination. In 1902, Cather published her first story, Peter, in which she wrote of a neighbor's suicide from the loneliness of displacement from the old world. In the decade that followed, Cather worked out her approach to the West in such stories as On the Divide, Eric Hermanson Soul, El Dorado, a Kansas recessional. She was priming herself, one might say, for the 1902 publication of The Virginian, the runaway bestseller inevitably cited as the book that inspired the genre of the Western novel. During the decade that followed, Cather deepened her engagement with the West by writing stories like The Enchanted Bluff. By the time Zane Grey published Writers of the Purple Sage, the book that, as L. Mitchell writes, firmly established the modern Western by offering a, offering a convincing sequel to Worcester, Cather was ready to enter the fray with her own version of the Western. Riders of the Purple Sage appeared in 1912, O Pioneers in 1913, Cather's story of a family's immigration and its, fa and its daughter's dedication to her family. One of the ideas I developed through the book is that whereas the Western presents a solitary heroic figure, the, the female version of the West presents family Im integration and family stories. Um, my Antony in 1918 appeared just five years later, the novel that most fully responds to the challenge to give birth to a nation, to this nation. By the time she wrote My Antonia, Cather had established her authenticity as a Western writer. She was, after all, a writer with a reputation, as the girl from Red Cloud who had gone to New York City and made good as managing editor of McClure's magazine and as the author of O Pioneers and the Song of the Lark. She told reporters of coming on a train to Nebraska, which was an open country then, not yet a country at all, but the materials out of which countries are made. And she wrote directly of her childhood in the opening section of the Song of the Lark, where to be sure that her Western identity remained unsullied by, the Nebraska, by her Nebraska background, she moved Red Cloud, renamed Moonstone, farther west to, to Colorado. The critical years for a writer from nine to 15, she repeated in interviews, explaining that in those years, impressions take hold to last a lifetime. Those were the only years in which Cather could claim first-hand first -hand experience of the West. In recent years, critics have charged Cather with masquerading behind Jim Burden, yet the record suggests something quite different that Cather was weaving herself into her fiction so clearly and so overtly that she could rely upon her readers to recognize herself in Jim Burden. Indeed, she depended upon their doing so to authenticate her version of the West. And Cather's readers would have understood how deeply Cather was in conversation with other writers. She made sure of that also. By titling her first Nebraska novel after Whitman's poem, Pioneers, O Pioneers, she positioned in herself in conversation with him, and by echoing Wister's opening in the Virginian, she was disputing his claim to the West when her tenderfoot, Jim Burden, arrived in the West from train from, by train from Virginia. It is to serve as witness to an immigrant neighbor rather than to a cowpuncher.
Cather lengthened the language of her West beyond that of Worcester and Whitman, of course. She cast herself in the tradition of Virgil as the first to bring the muse into my country. And then, by layering allusions, she provided resonance to that tradition. Jim's story builds to a scene in which he witnesses Antonia's children coming out of a fruit cellar, a veritable explosion of life out of the dark cave into the sunlight. Making explicit that this is Cather's version of the birth of America, Jim later reflects that Antonia is a rich mine of life, like the founders of early nations. And then Cather brings the succession of birth myths to the present. The power of the scene lies in our recognizing, not only sequentially, but incrementally, the, sequential, the um, sequence of myths that Cather has evoked. To recognize that the Cusack's fruit cave is reminiscent of the dug dugout cave that first held Antony in the New World and that echoes Native American myths, and from which she emerged as if in a, in a first birth, and that Antonia has fulfilled her destiny as a natural born mother, undeniably an earth mother. My Antonia is our country's, our nation's most fully realized birth myth, and it is useful to consider why. It belies the heroics of a plot. This is, after all, the story of an immigrant girl who grows up to rear a large family. And it defies any pretense at structure, as Jim Burden makes clear in saying, it hasn't any form. The dark dimensions to the novel, its gothic dimensions, deepen its complexity, the novel's relation, that is, to human experience. The Peter and Pavel story of throwing the bride to the wolves is a radical disruption to the sunny days of Jim's and Antonia's childhood, and Wick Cutter's plot to rape Antonia radically disrupts the ordinariness of life in Blackhawk. What my Antonia offers is a language of belief, a language so deeply resonant that it invites an ongoing conversation about what we value. I recall that, according to Barbara Hernstein Smith, quote, the function of myth is to encode ambivalence to allow a culture to maintain at least two incompatible ideas in some sort of stable relation with each other. Part three, the Gothic. Four decades after Cather, 1915, Jean Stafford, her dates are 1915 to 1979, was born west of the west. And I recall here Teddy Roosevelt described California as west of west. She moved from California to Colorado, where after a series of relocations, her parents settled in Boulder. After graduating from the university there, Stafford, quote, hot-footed it, it across the Rocky Mountains and across the Atlantic Ocean, first to Heidelberg, and then back in the United States to live out her life in the East. Whereas Cather wrote as a pioneer in art who was the first to bring the muse to her country, Stafford wrote, from within a West, fictionalized as a cultural code, a reality that was painfully personal for her. Her father, Stafford's father, wrote westerns under the pseudonym Jack Wonder. He had one best-selling best western named When Cattle Kingdoms Fell, which he failed miserably to repeat. Stafford grew up with first-hand experience of the failure of the popular western. In later life, she recalled hearing her father's oaths rising in heating ducts from the basement where in his study he was trying to write. In The Mountain Lion, her best-known novel, Stafford tells the story of Molly and Ralph, sister and brother, who are great friends and boon companions until, at adolescent, they are sent to a cattle ranch. There, Molly takes up riding while Ralph learns to hunt. He learns to hunt with his uncle, who dreams of killing a mountain lion he has seen at the ranch, splendid in her wildness and beauty, a prized trophy. Molly and Ralph separately go to nature to hunt, in two parallel plots. Molly's hunt is for the words to tell truthfully what is there, and Ralph's is to hunt for the lion. The two plots come together when Ralph, coming upon Molly in the mountain glade where she has gone to write, mistakes her for the lion, shoots her, and then hears a sound, quote, that could come only from a human throat, a bubbling of blood. The mountain lion takes us with Molly inside the Western script, in other words, and once there, it follows its inevitable outcome in, in violence. It is all about language. Within a year after completing The Mountain Lion, Stafford explained what it means to be a writer. 
quote, the language seems at times inadequate to convey exactly what we have seen and what we have deduced from it, and much too often writers shirk their responsibility and take refuge in rhetoric, as the preaching novelists do, or in snobbish esoteric jargon, and in elaborate approximations that almost but do not quite say what they mean. But the language is quite able to take care of any of our needs if we are only affectionate and respectful toward it, and above all, all patient in waiting for our observations to mature in us, to lose their confused immediacy so that their timelessness will emerge and their meaning will become available to our reader and applicable to him as well as to ourselves. When I woke up that morning in the fallow light before the sunrise and remembered that the night before I had got engaged to Rod Stevenson, I could feel my blue eyes growing bluer. So begins the mountain day. Jean Stafford's short story about 18-year-old Judy's store, quote, storybook summertime romance woven in the mountain sun and mountain moonlight that leads to her engagement to the, to the medical student Rod Stevenson. The next day, she announces her engagement to her family, goes on a picnic with Rod, and then learns that her grandmother's Irish maids had drowned. The drowning provides the climax of the story. The description of the bodies, a shocking contrast to the romantic holiday Judy had been describing. Quote, Mary and Eileen could not have been in the water for more than a few hours, but in that time the hellbenders and the ravenous turtles had eaten their lovely faces and their work swollen hands. No one, certainly no kinsman, must see them. Momentary silence intensifies the shock at the description. When Judy's grandmother does speak, she momentarily drops her social manner. Quote, By this time of day, I've had enough of the wonders of Colorado. And then, as if she were alone, as if she were speaking to herself or to God, she murmured, I won't come here again with innocence. She is speaking, however, to another innocent, for Judy is embarking upon a life she understands as little as the Irish servant girls understood the dangers of the lake. With cliché passing for cleverness, language in the mountain day is ominous in its numbing superficiality. Quote, the mountain sun had termed, turned him amber and had lightened his leonine hair, Judy says of Rod. He was tall and sculptured and violet-eyed, and the bones of his intelligent face were molded perfectly. As Judy speaks in cliché, so do those around her. Her mother tells her to have a skylark. Her sister calls Rod a pet, and her grandmother tells her that Rod was an Adonis, and she saw no port point in marrying if one couldn't marry a handsome man. Banality is dangerous, and to present that danger, Stafford created a mountain lake that is the unifying symbol of the story. Quote, it was a wonderful lake, limpid, blue, shaped like a heart, Judy says. Daddy stalked it each year, and the rainbow trout that come from it were so beautiful they looked like idealized paintings of trout. But there were some horrid inhabitants of that lovely water too, huge turtles and hellbenders about which her younger brother sometimes had screaming nightmares. With this lake, Stafford created a symbol for the romantic appearance at versus the cruel reality of the West, for beneath the mannered social banality of her characters' lives, as of the popular Western, exists a predatory violence against innocence, against those who don't read beneath the surface of the language. And finally, revisionings, revisioning the beginnings. A generation later, our contemporary, Marilyn Robinson, grew up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, took her PhD at Stanford, and, and then took a position on the writers, at the Writers Institute at Iowa. Whereas Stafford grew up with the West codified in the Western novel, Marilyn Robinson grew up with the Western codified further in film. She said, and of course there was and is a real West. I grew up in it, in lumber towns, yet it seemed to me that everything I knew about the West I learned from the movies. The West was the hero of so many movies. Robinson's response in housekeeping is to askew the visual for the verbal, to push metaphor back inside, as it were, to a new articulation. 
In her opening scene, Robinson places herself in an epic tradition with her first sentence, My name is Ruth. Its cadence echoing Melville's opening for Moby Dick. The plot concerns the relationship between two orphaned girls, Ruth and Lucille, and their aunt, Sylvie, who arrives to keep house for them, the title housekeeping. Yet Sylvie's idea of housekeeping is to let nature in rather than to keep it at bay. Quote, she preferred it, the house, sunk in the very element it was meant to exclude. We had crickets in the pantry, squirrels in the eaves, sparrows in the attic. Given such a premise, the surface plot moves inexorably toward dispossession. Lucille, fixing her sights on respectability and increasingly embarrassed at her sister's and aunt's eccentricities, eventually leaves them and goes to town to live with the high school home ec teacher. Ruth, ever more alone with Sylvie, gradually assumes habits of vagrancy. The townspeople, concerned over Ruth's welfare, begin custody proceedings. And to remain together, Ruth and Sylvie light fire to their house one night and set off across the railroad bridge to take up a life of wandering. Such a synopsis of housekeeping is akin to, to describing Moby Dick as a man's hunt for a whale, however, for it is not events but rather reflections structured as extended metaphors that make up both novels. Whereas Melville extended and pushed forward the metaphor of a hunt, Robinson extends and pushes backward the metaphor of birth. How might one reenact one's birth? Imagine oneself at conception. Conceive of oneself before creation. Whereas the biblical genesis establishes a forward movement of creation driven by acts that divide and separate, God makes heaven and earth out of nothing, then separates darkness from light, matter from air, woman from man, housekeeping reverses the movement. It returns light to darkness, form to void, and the many to the one, as Ruth pursues the memory of a lake and its associations until birth, with birth until she reaches the void, and in it discovers the loneliness from which, from which arises the need for, of analog. Following housekeeping, Stafford wrote, I mean, excuse me, Robinson wrote um, a second book called Mother Country. Whereas housekeeping has the density of metaphor, it's all about metaphor and language. Mother country, which is about the plutonium industry in Great Britain, it has the spare journalistic style of public discourse. It's a very interesting kind of um, um, juxtaposition of the two, or the one arising out of the two in a sense. Um, I'd like to read, um, a few pa the, the afterword is, is about um, three and a half pages, and I'd like to read from this afterword. Despite all our talk of change, some things remain the same. Frederick Jackson Turner's theories are still with us, as Barbara Meldrum has observed. His thesis given new life, most recently in The Legacy of Conquest. Patricia Nelson Limerick's expose of the dark underside of the Turner myth that has inspired its own progeny of conferences, exhibitions, and publications. The stakes are indisputably high, for they concern identity, who we are, where we came from, and what we value as a nation. Indeed, whether there is a we at all in this nation's identity. That is the question with which Limerick concludes her argument. The Tunerian frontier myth, embraced by white Americans as a creation myth, has an undeniable charm of simplicity, she writes. And then she continues that, quote, simplicity, alas, is the one quality that cannot be found in the story of the American West. As Limerick acknowledges, however, discrediting Turner is one thing. Finding an alternative is quite another. Quote, the cast of characters who inherit the West, the West, excuse me, the cast of characters who inherit the West's complex past is as diverse as ever, she writes. Indians, Hispanics, Asians, blacks, Anglos, business people, workers, politicians, bureaucrats, natives, and newcomers, we share the same region and its history, but we wait to be introduced. Propelled by principles of diversity, the cast of characters will continue to expand 
What about farmers and factory workers, gays and lesbians, children and women? Yet we will remain waiting to be introduced so long as we proceed by variations upon the conflict of a single plot. Here I refer to the frontier thesis not for the story that it tells, but rather for the manning, manner of its telling, a dialectic by which thesis, antithesis, and th synthesis occur most famously as a conflict between civilization and wilderness from which emerges a new American. In recent decades, we've grown increasingly skeptical about the notion of a synthesis and correspondingly hesitant to use the pronoun we, but the dialectics opposition has remained with us. Women versus men, white versus color, victor versus victim, rural versus urban, the country versus the academy, are some of the variations of that plot that are given narrative forms as the gender wars, the canon wars, the culture wars, of course, we're now in a, in a political season that is in which we're seeing this in spades. I hope to find a better way as I set out in search of women who responded in terms of the West to call uh, in terms of the West to the call to give birth to a nation. Instead of finding a challenge to the master plot, however, I found a challenge to the very premise of a plot. Margaret Fuller, Willa Cather, Jean Stafford, and Marilyn Robinson suggest that what matters is not which story we tell, but rather the manner of our telling. Each in her own way probes the frontier plot of opposition and, exposing the violence at its heart, discards the plot. Having cleared the stage, each offers a principle of relationship embodied in the conversation as it is articulated in the West where communities are formed rather than inherited, and where the importance of the land mandates that community be understood by ecological principles. Conversation is a national epic. I find the idea intriguing as it emerges from these four disparate writers who demonstrate the potential range, flexibility, and rigor of, of the conversation. Fuller designed her conversations as a forum to prepare women to take up action, and then she extends the manner of those conversations into Summer on the Lakes. Cather posits the genesis of my Antonia as a conversation between herself and a childhood friend, extends the manner of the conversation into reading by receiving the manuscript he brings to her, and then structures the narrative to climax in the kinship aesthetics of a family in conversation. Stafford structures the mountain line as a conversation between a brother and a sister that, upon adolescence, is cleaved by gender conventions. And Robinson draws upon the meditative tradition in writing housekeeping as the self in conversation with the landscape, and then extends the colloquy in Mother Country's Call to Action. By their uses of conversation, these writers disprove frontier plots of opposition. Merging the gendered space of private versus public, each wrote from her personal life with a self-consciously public impulse to articulate the identity of a nation. Together they offer conversations as a fem female Bildungsroman that is a voyage out as well as in. Discarding opposition between high and low art, they use the conversation, that seemingly most casual of genres, as the form for their epic. The ranking of canonical versus non-canonical is rendered similarly ludicrous by the vagaries of literary reputation. Fuller has achieved longevity largely through her reincarnation in the pop, pop culture of literary personalities. Cather has been elevated from marginal to canonical status with a light speed of a single decade. Stafford remains unread within the academy, known, if at all, as Robert Lowell's first wife. And though critics hailed Robinson's first book as an instant classic, they've scarcely acknowledged that she wrote a second. In terms of male versus female and white versus color, perhaps it should not have surprised me, as it did, that the women who responded to the challenge to give birth to this nation in terms of the West were white and educated. As such, however, 
As such, however, they contribute to diversity in our national discourse. From their cultural role of other in the Western myth, they probe the sources and effects of cultural alterity. By virtue of their dual status, mainstream and marginalized, they provide an alternative discourse that both provides access and also accommodates difference. What is at issue in such a discourse is language and each, each invites a rigorous close reading that trains one's ear to hear the nuances of words as they are culturally, historically, and individually inflected. Observing daily examples of the leveling effects of mass media, what Marilyn Robinson calls the moral aphasia that describes the failure of a populace to engage with issues that threaten its humanity and that indeed threaten the survival of life on our planet, I'm convinced that such training is critically important. Talking about Stafford's The Mountain Day in a, reach, in a graduate seminar, for example, I was horrified to realize that my students were reading its cliched language straight. Like the story's character, Judy Grayson, they were unsettled by the mutilated bodies of maids recovered from the lake. But like Judy, they found comfort in the love plot of a Western sojourn. That was our first discussion of Stafford. By month's end, her stories had awakened these readers to cultural inflections of language and engaged them with issues of power conveyed through those inflections. Such stories are the best anecdote I know to, cult to moral aphasia. The Western myth that Fuller, Cather, Stafford, and Robinson embark upon is a search for the genesis of the cultural myth in language. Keeping a journal of her travels, Fuller sets out toward the frontier to woo the mighty meaning of the scene. Placing herself in the tradition of Virgil, bringing the muse to her neighborhood, Cather recovers fertility myth from classical, Native American, and European per permutations, and combining procreativity with creativity, celebrates an immigrant woman as a new world's earth mother. By placing her fictional daughters within cultural myths of the West, Stafford exposes the violence at the heart of those myths. After freeing her characters from domestic plots of the gendered West, Robinson explores the birth meta metaphor, pushing it back before conception and finding in loneliness a new articulation of the epistemology of language's generativity. By resisting closure, the reciprocity of conversation reinforces language's generativity. My friends, may they see and do more, Fuller writes at the end of Summer on the Lakes. In giving his manuscript to Cather, Jim Burden asks, now what about yours? In taking Molly Fawcett inside the literary West, Stafford challenges us to revisit its language with her as our companion. And in the final pages of Robinson's housekeeping, Ruth tells the reader to imagine Lucille imagining her. In this manner, conversation models the give and take at the heart of every moral system. Social reciprocity means taking turns, listening as well as speaking. Surely it is a better way. <laughs>